Hi everyone, it's Theodora and I'm here with soprano Madeline Renee to talk about advice she has for young singers. She has sung in almost every major opera house. I want to start off by asking you about what your opinion is on what young singers should focus on right now at the beginning of their careers. Okay, let's start from the very beginning then, as they say. The most important thing is your voice. Uh, your voice is the only thing you should be focusing on at the very beginning of your career. And that means getting your technique in order, uh, making sure that your passaggio is not a problem to navigate, that you've got your high notes, that you've got your, your voice lined up in the right way. Um, that your middle range, it doesn't wobble because it's unsteady. You just have to find out where the epicenter of your voice is and work from there up and down. And, you know, uh, all, we're all different people. We all have different instruments. People uh, develop at different rates. But the one thing that you have to do as a young singer is work, work, work on your technique and uh, line up your voice so that you're not, so you're in command of your voice as much as is possible. Because like everything else, as we mature, our voice matures and our technique matures and everything comes together. So don't don't expect instant instant opera singer, you know? I mean, you have to be patient with yourself. And the only way you can do that is to go into a practice room and just go over things over and over again until you're happy with it. Um, that's the first thing, the voice. And uh, that can include many other things. You know, technique is agility. Most important thing in your singing always is pitch, uh, your sense of pitch. You know, there's nothing worse. I can hear somebody who's not a singer sing way off pitch and I get a big laugh out of it. And I actually think it's funny, but if I go to a theater and the singer is off pitch, you know, it's like, they don't deserve to be on that stage, okay? So you have to, and a very good way to do that as a, very, as a young singer, when you're studying, uh, you can tape yourself. And nowadays you can even videotape yourself. So uh, you can really, I learned a lot from listening to my lessons over and over again, where I thought I could make things better as a young singer. So, you know, you have to know some voices have the pianissimos on the high notes, some don't, some need can achieve them by working at them. I mean, it's just, it's a long, long process, but you have to be very rigorous and you have to be, um, you know, it's, it's hard earned. I mean, I've looked at things that I thought I would never be able to sing you know, things with agility, and then through hard work, I've done them extremely well. But, you know, in the beginning, I was like, oh, God, I'll never be able to sing this. So, you know, if you work hard at something, you can get it, especially because a young singer is at a time in their vocal development where they have possibilities to really uh, do a lot with the voice. When you're in your 20s, your voice can go, there's some sort of fly here. Um, your, your voice can do a lot of different things that maybe as you get hold, older and you, you know, even develop some bad habits or something, you're no longer able to do. So start with the voice. Um, and from there, language, text. Um, a lot of young singers think about the music, but they don't think about the text. And the text is also very important because most of opera is in a different language. It's either in Italian, it's French, it's German. So you really have to uh, be able to have a good knowledge, a, a, at least a good phonetic knowledge of the language. I remember, um, I was lucky because I grew up in France as a little girl, so I, my French was already, uh, perfect. I was fluent. Um, and I learned Italian when I was in college. And then I always had Italian boyfriends, so that helped too. Um, and then, and then um, I learned German first phonetically while I was at Juilliard. We had a teacher that she hammered us. So, I mean, I could read a, a German newspaper and sound like I was, you know, fluent, but I didn't know what I was saying. Of course, later on, I did study German and got some command of the language there too. You know, when you start studying a song, the first thing you should do before you even sit down at the piano and learn the melody is read through the text. See what it means, first of all, so you know what you're singing about. Because if you're singing something you don't know what you're singing, it's gonna transmit to the audience. So see what the song is about, see the text, speak through the text, in einen Bichlein helle, you know, something like that, whatever it is, whatever you're singing, go through it, see where you have difficulties, see where it's difficult for you, and, and work on that. Just Even just reading out loud a text is important, but know what you're singing 
and then go back to the piano and start putting the words to the music. Thank you. When you see young singers today performing at the beginning of their careers, do you feel like they are forgetting something important? I do master classes. What I tell singers, um, you know, usually young singers get out on a stage and they're already excusing themselves for being young singers before they even, you know, open their mouths. We forget sometimes that we have this beautiful gift in our throats and we're there to share the gift. If you walk out on a stage and you're thinking, oh my God, what are they going to think? Oh, is, am I going to be good enough? Am I, is this not going to sound okay? You know, you're already um, disqualifying yourself to yourself before you even get out there. So what I tell young singers is remember, you're trying to share your gift with the audience. You have something that they want to listen to. So when you go out on a stage, think of the audience as your friends, as if you were sitting in your living room and you are sharing something with, special with them, which is your voice. And even if you go into an audition or a competition or something, I really think that that is psychologically very important. Because if you walk out there thinking, am I going to be good enough? Are they going to like me? Then you're already, your whole performance is about what they're thinking of you and not what you're thinking about yourself. So that's, um, that's one of the big traps. And that's something that I learned later in my own career, which was, you know, to enjoy it, enjoy it. Even if it, you're at an audition and you don't think you'll ever get the part or whatever, you know, enjoy the moment, get out there and do your best, prepare. That's the most important thing. Go out there, feel prepared, do your best. There are things that can go wrong in auditions. There are things that can go wrong during a performance, but it's just one moment of your life. It's not going to determine whether you have a career, don't have a career. You know, so many singers that are, have had fabulous careers from Joyce Di Donato to Renee Fleming. We've all gone through, including myself, we've all had moments that, you know, things didn't go the way we wanted. But you have to, you have to have some resilience there and you have to believe in yourself. Thank you. I think that's really great to hear. Just to be able to enjoy the moment is so important because there are lots of obstacles in this career. So I know a lot of singers who debate whether they should sort of go to Europe, if they're an American singer in any case, if they should go in Europe or they should try and start their career in the US. Do you find that there is one that is easier than the other? This year, it'll be 40 years since I started singing, since I had my debut. Uh, I started, I had my debut in 1980, singing La Boheme with Luciano Pavarotti. So that was an auspicious debut. Um, however, the world has changed so much over the past, I would say, two generations at this point. Once upon a time, people would go to uh, Germany and to places that had repertory houses because there was more of a chance of learning the repertoire and of getting roles and being fest, which was being um, part of a, uh, oh my God, hold on a second. My husband's making noise in the background. <laughs> Hurting me. <laughs> I totally understand. I tell everyone, be quiet. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, people would do repertory company. That's what I was trying to say before. And that would give you a chance to learn many roles and in the, in the course of a season. And most of all, it gives you a chance to perform. We as young artists, or you as young artists, the more you get out on a stage, the better you will feel because it is through performance that we learn our craft. You know, you can study, 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 but you get out on a stage and everything changes. So, you know, the rapport with the space, with the audience, with your, even how you, your, you hear your own voice. Um, you know, in a practice room, we make big sounds sometimes and they sound big inside of us, but maybe they don't get over the orchestra pit. So you have to learn to, be able to pro project your voice in a different way to make sure the sound is going out when you're singing in a big house. So all of these things, um, in Europe, once upon a time, there was more opportunity for repertory companies. However, I do think that nowadays in the States, there are a lot of smaller companies, there are a lot of uh, uh, recital programs, there are a lot of other venues where opera is performed it's become a lot more popular thanks to PBS, thanks to opera being shown on television. And um, I've never felt that opera was a dying art because, uh, you know, the, 
we put a man on the moon, but human love, hate, anger, jealousy, all those emotions that even Shakespeare was writing about, you know, in the 1500s, and nothing's changed. So opera is just a musical man. It's like the soap opera from the 1700s, you know what I mean? Um, you know, nowadays a lot of uh, directors, stage directors are modernizing operas. But the music and the sentiment and everything remains the same. I'm getting, I'm uh, digressing here. Um, but there are opportunities and companies that have young singer programs and things like that in the States now that did not exist in my day. So um, I'm not really qualified to say where the real opportunities are. I know they still have the repertory companies in, uh, they don't have them in, in Italy, but I know they do have them in Germany still. And who knows, I don't know the other, they have them in Belgium or France or anything. But um, whatever opportunity you get to perform as a young singer is going to help you enormously to get ahead. Thank you. Um, I do want to ask you about auditioning in a more general way. Um, when you started out, do you feel like a lot of your auditions came from your personal network or did they happen in a more formal setting? Auditioning, it, it's like a process. It's, you have to go through it. Whether you're a, an opera singer or a Broadway singer or a Broadway dancer, audition is the way you get chosen. Um, so you have to develop a hard skin about it um, I got auditions through many different ways when I was, when I first got out of school and even when I was in school. Uh, so I can't really say, you know, obviously if best case scenario, you have an agent, the agent sends you out on auditions for specific roles or specific company things, but not everybody can get an agent right away. So, um, there are other ways where you find out maybe online now, you know, I'm, I'm, technically sort of, uh, as I say in Italian, analfabeta, which means I, I'm not really good on the online stuff, but there are many, many ways to get yourself out there nowadays. Uh, YouTube, uh, webinars, or whatever they're called. Sorry, <laughs> dating myself. But uh, young singers can be heard online. Uh, we're doing a video interview. You know, maybe now, especially with this COVID-19, there'll be video auditions. I don't know. But I don't think that anything can really um, replace um, an audition in a theater on the stage because unless you have the sense of the space around you from the stage, it's really hard to judge a voice. There's a famous story about Birgit Nielsen who, when she auditioned from the, for the Met years ago, she was a famous Wagnerian singer, uh, they thought her voice was too small. And then when she got out on the stage, she just blasted. <laughs> Sharon. Um, <laughs> Hi, Sharon. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, in terms of getting your auditions, um, you know, that you need to prepare auditions and it's more important that young singers think about the repertoire they want to sing and what the roles are that they want to be auditioning for. Great. Which leads me to the next thing, which is repertoire. One of the hardest things for young singers to understand is what repertoire works best for their voice. Now, when I was young, just coming out of Juilliard, I used to sing the Zerlina, the Despina, the Pamina, you know, the, the lighter uh, Mozart roles, the soubrette, because that was what my voice was like at that moment. The Adina and Elisea d'Amore, you know, those sorts of things. But Later on, as my voice grew and developed, it took on a much darker hue and my timbre was uh, more uh, heavier, as they say. So then I started doing the Don Elvira's and, and I sang the Countess and I sang, you know, the, the, he, the lyric soprano roles. But you have to know, even early on in your career, what your vo where your voice is, even just at that moment. So if you are a really young singer, it's not, doesn't make sense for you to go sing Sola Perduta Abbandonata or Santuzza unless your voice is that kind of a voice. And, you know, some people already have that kind of a voice. But as I said, you know, uh, if you're a coloratura soprano, you probably can sing the bell song at 21 or 22 years old and it sounds perfect. But if you're going to be a dramatic soprano, you're going to have to wait a few years until your voice develops. And if you sing the wrong repertoire, I, uh, I remember 
years ago in the 80s when uh, Luciano Pavarotti first started the Philadelphia vocal competition. I won't say any names, but there was one singer, she sang something and she was about to be eliminated. Um, and, and I remember saying, why doesn't she sing something else? And she sang something else and it was glorious. And she went on to have a huge career, like huge, you know, met La Scala, everything. So you have to make sure that what you pick out also for an audition is what's gonna be right for your voice and show you off to your best You've had an incredibly successful career in Italy, and I was wondering if you felt that there was a difference in the audition process in Italy. Well, you know, a lot of it, I, I had an agent in Italy. So, you know, the agent would find me the, the, the work. And uh, after I had auditioned a few times, once you audition and you get a few roles in a few theaters, it's easier to get more roles, you know? Um, so uh, when I first started... I've auditioned in France, I've auditioned in Italy. You know, I honestly don't see that much of a difference. Uh, usually you have the casting director who used to be the artistic director, now they call them the casting director, uh, sitting in the audience, maybe the head of the general manager of the theater was there, maybe there's a conductor there who's at that moment conducting an opera and likes to hear, you know, what the young talent is that's coming through. Um, but, you know, you still have to get out on the stage. And um, I've worked with young singers on how to best present yourself, how to get, walk out on a stage so that you look nice with confidence to say hello to the people in the audience, you know, you know, you're not, not, oh, you know. Um, uh, hopefully you'll have a chance to work with the pianist beforehand. That's very important. And if you don't have a chance to work with the pianist beforehand, there's nothing wrong with going over to the piano saying to the uh, pianist, uh, look, I, if you wouldn't mind, you know, sotto voce, I, I'd like to, if you could just move this phrase here, move that phrase there, you know, you're gonna give him your own score, so you will have markings in your score. Um, and, you know, don't be afraid to ask for something. You don't ask, you don't get, right? So do what you need to do. And the point is that when you're in a, one of the biggest dangers in auditions I found, and one of the most frustrating things for me when I was doing auditions as young, sometimes you feel like the pianist was either dragging or pulling you, you know? And it's like, oh no, why is he going this fast? Or, oh damn it, he's going too slow. You know, I'm gonna kill, I don't have the breath to get through the phrase. So um, if I could go back in my career and do my auditions again, I would be the one with my voice to dictate the tempo. And if he can't follow me, then he's going to look bad. Instead of me looking bad, then I can't follow him. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so you traveled a lot for your career. And I am curious, were there any, uh, do you have any vocal health tips for the singers of today? Well, the tips are always the same. If you're performing, I, look, we singers, our voice is our instrument. And if you leave, you don't leave a Stradivarius out in the rain, you know, you have to take care of your voice. Unfortunately, that means you have to, um, you have to be careful. First of all, you don't want to catch a cold. Uh, you don't want to catch a sore throat. Uh, you don't want to be in a smoky environment. You don't want to be sitting in a draft. Uh, you know, the, the list is endless. Singers are very hyper, but reasonably so, uh, you know, it's, it's understandable. I mean, if you said to any lawyer, you're gonna miss a whole month's pay if you don't, you know, if you get a cold, you know, they're gonna be careful not to get a cold. I mean, we work, this is our life, this is our job. If we can't, if, we are, if we're sick, then we can't sing. And I would always caution any young singer never to sing if you have a sore throat or you're not 100% because people will not remember something they didn't hear. But if they heard something that didn't sound right, they will always remember it. So you must really, it's better to say, I can't sing today. I have, you know, I'm not feeling well, my voice isn't responding, than to uh, take the risk of singing badly. So that's number one. Um, when you're traveling, you know, it's kind of a, cloister, a cloistered uh, clausura. It's a cloistered existence as a singer. Because basically you go from the theater to the hotel, from the theater to the hotel. Um, you may go out to eat dinner with your colleagues after the show, but then it's like to bed because one of the most important things that singers need is sleep. You have to get a good night's sleep. 
So um, you have to take care of your instrument. And unfortunately for us, it's not like you take your, you put your violin back in your case at the end of the evening. And even if you have 102 fever, you can still, you know, or play the piano. We need to be in good shape physically. I've mentioned before, you've had an incredibly successful career. And I'm curious, when you look back at your career, do you feel like there was something that you did in particular that made you so successful? Well, yeah, uh, I sang well, that helped. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it was very, I was, I had a very, very high standard for myself. Um, um, I had the chance early on in my career of working with some very important singers. Um, I, I met Luciano Pavarotti during the master classes and he worked with my voice for many years, for almost nine years. And I had a bird's eye view of the profession at the highest level. Uh, you know, it was for me, I would see Renata Scotto, Mirella Freni, Leontine Price, uh, Shirley Barrett. Uh, I mean, all the great sopranos of that era, Joan Sutherland. I mean, that was my standard. And I was, you know, in my early 20s at the time. So I've always been very rigorous with myself and I've always um, held myself to a very high standard. And that helped me to do my very best. So I, I was very hard on myself. And uh, I, I can say that that is the thing that drove me the most in my career, was just making sure I always was totally prepared and preparation. Preparation does everything. You know, I've had my, uh, I've had my difficult moments. Uh, I remember I did, I was singing Violetta in La Traviata in San Francisco. And I had gone and debuted the role in Bulgaria because my agent at the time said, look, why don't you sing a few performances in Bulgaria? You know, you're far away from everyone. You know, San Francisco is a big house and all that. So I went to Bulgaria and I sang it so well. I was like, yes. And people were cheering and they had, you know, they had standing room only in the theater for the second and third performance. So I was feeling very, you know, I was feeling good about my Violetta. And then I got to uh, San Francisco and I panicked. I just got the worst and the only really huge, huge, huge debilitating case of stage life of my life. You know, I thought, um, I, during the dress rehearsal, I had sung very well, but the first performance, right before everybody leaves the stage in the first act, I, I was feeling nervous. So I drank some water on the stage and it went down the wrong way. So it was stuck in my throat and I had to sing the Sempre Libera with, you know, like this drop of water in the wrong place in my throat. And of course, you know, by the end of the aria, the, the high seas, I sounded like some dog yelping. I mean, it was just, it was God awful. And I walked off the stage and I thought, I'll never get through this. And uh, I remember at the time, a friend of mine had sent me <laughs> a fruitcake from Christmas. She made this fruitcake, it was loaded with liquor. Um, and I had a little piece in my dressing room to sort of, and all of a sudden I was totally relaxed and I sang the rest of the opera, great. But you know, you can't sing La Traviata, you can't sing Violetta and Scorpio first act aria. So I, I thought this was the end of my career and I left the theater the next day. I said, I'm sorry, I just, I, I was just too frightened to go on, you know, something like that. And I never sang the role again, which I'm sorry about because it was a great role and I loved it. Um, but I really thought, oh my God, that's gonna be the end of my career. Nobody will ever hire me again. This is 1987. But I went on and had a good career afterwards. So, you know, uh, we all have our moments where things are difficult, where you think, oh no, this is the end. I've screwed it up forever. And, uh, but no, it's, that's it. It's like, you know, you might not get the test that you want on your SAT, but you might still get into a really good college and may end up being something really important in life. You know, you can't let one incident get you down or decide what's going to happen the rest of your career. I think that's amazing to hear um, because I know that singers all the time are worried about mistakes on every level, small or big. So thank you for sharing that experience. Um, I'm curious if you had a specific way of preparing roles and if you have tips for the young singers who are about to learn some bigger roles. Well, you know, I think when you're preparing a role, the first thing you have to do, um, if it's a Carmen or a Tosca, for instance, you know, there's a lot of literature about these personalities, these characters. Sardou, 
uh, wrote Tosca, the original play, and uh, the Carmen is Prosper um, Merimé. Uh, and you know, you can you can read the original plays, you can read some of the background, you can read the history. I always tell young singers, don't just limit yourself to the opera. Look at what years it was written in. Look at what was happening politically at that time. Look at who the painters were of that era. Look, find out a bit about the cultural things that were happening at that time, because every opera was written in a historical context, you know, whether it was Rossini or whether it's Mozart or whatever. Um, and these are important things. And if you study the other aspects around the opera, you can get also a better feel for the character you're doing. And that'll help you in your interpretation. I mean, let's take Tosca, which is my absolute favorite role. Um, you know, Tosca was really ahead of her time. It was 1800. And she wasn't married. And she was living with her lover. And she was a singer, uh, an opera singer, you know. And that was pretty racy at that time. Uh, to be living in, you know, sin with her boyfriend, Mario Cavaradossi. And, you know, Scarpia was making some pretty heavy-handed uh, sexual harassment passes at her. Uh, so, um, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a hot opera. Um, and, of course, the music is wonderful. So, but when I studied it, I did, I, I had seen the opera many, many times. I encouraged young singers listen to other singers, listen to other interpretations. Uh, nowadays, you can see so many operas on video. You know, uh, my generation, we didn't have videos of operas yet. But nowadays, you just go on YouTube and you can see, you know, hundreds of interpretations. T check them out, see, see what you like, pick and choose. Um, if there's something you like and you wanna imitate it, go ahead. I mean, that's, that's helpful. Um, Imitation is the highest form of flattery. And, you know, we all would like to sound like uh, either Schwarzkopf or uh, Tibaldi or Leontine Price. I mean, you know, if, if you hear a singer and you feel like your voice can do that same thing, go for it. The day of a performance, most singers wake up and the first thing they do is like, is my voice there? <laughs> Every singer does that. So it's like, and you're going, hmm, ah, ah, hmm, hmm. Okay, my voice is there. Once you know your voice is there, you get up, you should have your morning coffee. This is what I did. You have your breakfast. Right before lunch, you go to the piano uh, and you start to do your humming exercises. I do remember, I, I have learned through the years that humming is a great way to warm up the voice. You don't aggredire le corde vocale right away, you know, so it's a way of sort of, just light warming up your voice, which gets the, the, the high, nice position that kind of forges the way for your bigger voice to get in through, um, forging the trail. And then, you know, you go up and down the scale a couple of times, um, and then you go have lunch. Now, one thing, this is my biggest advice to young singers, do not leave your voice in the dressing room. I have heard so many voices that go on and on and on in the dressing room, you know, for like an hour before a performance. And then they get out on the stage and they have no voice. Do not use up your voice in the dressing room. Now, uh, the famous singers that I have seen, including Pavarotti, would go into the dressing room, uh, sing through their vocalized for about five minutes. And then they'd sing through their first aria once. And that was it. And that's what I would do too. That's what I learned to do. So you sing before lunch and then before you go to the theater and then you have your lunch, you rest in the afternoon. I always took a little nap. And then after that, you know, you go to the theater, warm up in your dressing room, do your vocalizing, you know, for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever you need, but not, don't overkill, okay? If there's a difficult phrase in an aria and you want to go over it a couple of times, you know, you'd make sure your high notes there, do that. But then silence. Silence is golden. Uh, Marilyn Horn used to say that she would do 24 hours of silence before performance. So, and it does do wonders for the voice. Silence does wonders for the voice. So the day before the performance, start in the evening, don't go out, never go out the night before performance unless, you know, it's like you have to meet the Pope. 
Um, just stay home, rest, keep quiet, save your voice, okay? Because you need to save your voice before you have a performance. <laughs> That's my advice for a performance, to get the best out of yourself and get a good night's sleep. Don't go to bed too late. Don't drink too much wine. Stay away from the liquor the night before you have to sing. You can have a nice big glass of wine after the performance. Nowadays, it's so important to have a good online presence. And, you know, people talk about brand a lot. And I was curious, throughout your career, did you feel like you had developed a brand and maybe it was very naturally that you ensured would be present at all times? You know, Theodore, I'm sorry to say, um, I belonged to an era where there was no such thing as online presence, you know? Um, your online presence were your reviews, which you would send to different people. But, you know, the web sort of started to come into its own at the beginning of, you know, 2004, 2005. And um, before that, I mean, the bulk of my career, the really important stuff I did as an opera singer happened before then. So I can't, I'm not really, uh, technology has not really played a role in my, the only thing it did play a role was television. And in 1986, I was on TV. And in 1979, I was on TV, uh, television. And, and my day, it was if you were on television and I was on interviews when I sang here or sang there, I would go on television and give an interview on a news, you know, we're singing this, we're doing the Merry Widow in Houston, or we're doing, you know, whatever, La, La Pericole in Geneva, and you know, you would give interviews on television, and that was what the web was then. I do know that for young singers today, it's very important to have, you know, Instagram, and, uh, well, I hate to say this, but, you know, a lot of that is, I feel bad for this generation, because it, I think it's a lot of bullshit, to be honest with you, but, um, but it is important, because, you know, I mean, I think it's more important to go into the practice room for an hour than sit there. But the point is, you know, I wanted to know who you were. I went on your site and I saw this beautiful Fior di Ligi that you did. And I knew something about you that I wouldn't have known otherwise. So yes, not to contradict myself, but it is helpful and it is important to have an online presence. Um, but you have to also know what you're doing with that because, you know, you have to have the right stuff on there. So luckily today, there are people that can help you do that. So that's all I'm saying. <laughs> but in my day, it, di it didn't really play a role in my career. And it doesn't now either. I mean, you know, I have a Facebook page. I have an Instagram page. I did a Baroque concert recently. So I was, I dressed up in a Baroque costume and, and you know, I put a little snippet of it on uh, online. But you know, I don't know if that's going to enhance me in any way or not. It's kind of, you know, at my age, uh, it's just sort of a, a memory. Not th but I am singing. I have to tell you something. Uh, I recently uh, was asked to do a Carmen. Uh, and then unfortunately, the COVID virus came along. Um, I have a, I was supposed to have a concert uh, in a couple of weeks, but I think it's been canceled, uh, Bruckner today um, with orchestra. Um, I go to my voice lesson every week. I have not missed a voice lesson in 40 years, okay? Why do I go to a voice lesson at my age, even though I'm not you know, out there singing in all the top houses anymore? Because as a singer, uh, we, our voice is who we are. We identify ourselves according to our voice and, and our, our being singers. It's like really important to us. So I keep my voice limber. I think that once you stop studying and, you know, some people can do it on their own. I'm a bit lazy. I have my teacher, but I have a wonderful teacher. So, um, and it brings me back to myself and it keeps my voice in shape because if you don't keep your voice in shape, you know, even if you don't sing for two or three weeks, your voice, it's like being an athlete. You know, you don't, if you have to run a hundred meters, you have to do it every day in order to keep yourself in shape. And even during this time, I would say to all young singers that are out there, do not sit at home in front of Netflix and don't get lazy. You know, stand at the piano 15, 20 minutes a day, that's all you need and go through your exercises. 
usually well, you don't, you're not in the mood to start, but then once you start, you get in the mood and then it, it gets longer, you know, but you're doing your body, you're doing your mind a favor. And I think that singers in general are lucky because we get a lot of our tensions out through our voice. A lot of people, all, all people, you know, your breathing apparatus is where all the tension in your body collects. You know, as soon as you get anxious, you feel like you can't breathe. And singing is one of the healthiest way to get all your emotions out and all your anxieties out. So um, I think singing is a wonderful thing to do, even if you're not a singer. But if you are a singer, then you must, must get to the piano, get your voice out every day. It's cathartic and it helps you deal with so many of the other things going on in your life. No matter what I was going through in my life, once I started to sing, if I sang for an hour, everything, the sky, the, it was sunny and the flowers were, you know, it's just, it's such a, we're so lucky, you know, we have to remember that. Um, I couldn't agree more. I found it to be very helpful actually through this. Um, I now want to ask you, through the course of your career, have you seen some big trend changes in opera? And um, do you have any predictions on where opera is headed? Okay, I've seen, I've seen a lot of uh, changes. Uh, when I started being interested in opera, opera was limited to the opera stage only for, you know, the two, 3,000 people that were there at a time. In my day, they started broadcasting opera on television. And that was already, you know, PBS used to do the, the Met broadcasts. And that was a very exciting thing uh, because all of a sudden opera became television. And that changed a lot too. Television and now video and all these high definition broadcasts have brought opera to the big screen even. It's gone beyond the television. So you need credible acting nowadays. The acting has improved like 500%. Um, people want to see something that's natural, that's credible with, with good looking singers that look their role, you know? It's true, the voice is the most important thing, but nowadays people want something visually convincing as well. Thank you. So I'm now at the point of the interview where I like to ask my favorite questions. Um, what advice do you have to your younger self? Well, I think I sort of said it in the first few minutes, just to enjoy the process, to, to realize that even when you're out on a stage um, and you're, you may be worried that you're not doing it well or, or, or whatever, you're, you know, just enjoy it because one day those moments will seem like the best moments of your life. Um, you're so fortunate. You know, I, I went through Juilliard and, um, you know, there's some people there that I thought had incredible voices, but they didn't have the careers, you know? If you're lucky enough to have a career, enjoy it. Enjoy being out on the stage, enjoy those moments, and um, worry less, sing more for the other people, and enjoy the whole thing as much as you can. That's all I can say. It's not, it's not really useful advice, but uh, be rigorous, do your best, but then don't be too hard on yourself, you know? Um, uh, you have to you have to be hard on yourself before you get out on the stage. Lots of things can happen once you're out there, but still you're out there to enjoy yourself. And if you are enjoying yourself, the audience will feel it. Everything that happens. Why is it so important to the, the audience response? It's because they can feel you. It's it's not about the voice. The voice. It, it's more, it's your personal charisma, it's your ability to communicate, it's how expressive you are, how does your voice touch people, um, that's it. You know, when you're dying as Mimi, it's true, it's very sad, but the difference between very sad and really making people, you can hear everybody going in the audience is, is you know, how, how you're into it, what you're giving the audience. So all I'm saying is, um, Enjoy what you do. I mean, I think you probably covered it, but any parting words of advice? I think before people go into this career, they really have to consider a lot of things because it's, it's a very difficult career. It involves a lot of sacrifice. Um, it's very hard on relationships. I mean, after all, if you're a successful opera singer, you're traveling all the time, you're not home, you're, you know, your two weeks rehearsal and then your two week performance times, uh, 
you know, you can be away from home for a lot of times. It's also a very lonely profession. You know, you're going from the hotel to the theater, uh, unless you have a spouse or a boyfriend with you, but that's not really uh, usual because usually your partner has a job and it's not usually unless he's an opera singer or she's an opera singer, you're at, uh, but it's unlikely that you'll be singing together also. So, um, and nowadays the jobs are less, the pay is less, uh, opera houses have scaled down their pay scales. So it's, uh, there's a lot of competition. So I think before you go in, I don't want to discourage anyone, but you really have to have incredible drive, incredible drive in order to succeed. And nowadays, on top of it, you have to have all that technological stuff lined up too. You know, your website, your Facebook, your blah, blah, blah. So um that also puts added pressure on people. So um, I'm not saying don't try, go for it, but also you have to be realistic if at a certain point you really don't think. And I'm not saying give up right away. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. Um, anybody who's successful has had to, you know, had face failure a few times. But you will have to deal with some unhappiness and some sacrifice in order to get where you need to be. Um, I'm very lucky. I feel like in some, uh, I've had it all because I had marriage. I have a son who was a, was a musician. He went to, he went to the New England Conservatory of Music, and he has a wonderful voice. But he's uh, basically into contemporary music and improvisation. Uh, but he's very, very talented. But it's hard to find work as a musician nowadays, you know. And what is happening right now in the world does not facilitate anybody's, the, the beginning of anybody's career, because right now all the opera houses are closed all over the world. So uh, I don't have any projections for the future. The only projection I will make is that culture is what defines any society and music and art and opera are all part of what has made the world a better place for everyone. So sooner or later, things will get back on the right track and opera will be a part of it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. You're welcome, Theodora. Good luck in Boca Lupo with your uh, career. And I'm sure you'll have a wonderful one. You have a wonderful voice. So take care. All the best. And thanks to all of you for listening today. I'm Theodora, and we've been in the wings with Madeline Renee. If you liked this video, please subscribe to my channel. If you have questions that you would like me to ask in the future, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you can join us next time.